is Rick Berman. I'm Brandon Braga. Uh, this is a reunion of sorts. Rick and I haven't seen each other in 17 years. <laughs> we, had, we had lunch two years ago. We had lunch two years ago. Uh, we had dinner with Manny Cotto. Mm -hmm. And we're here to talk about Enterprise. Or Star Trek Enterprise, probably at this point. When Rick first got the idea for this show, and I remember the phone call that I got when Rick approached me to be involved, the whole concept behind the show was to make it Star Trek that was closer to people today. A Star Trek where we, we had spent so much time in outer space in spandex outfits, we were, we were eager to have people, you used to say, wear tennis shoes and be more grounded. And therefore, Star Trek was left, I think it was your idea to leave Star Trek out of the title. Well, you know, we had Star Trek Next Gen, Star Trek, Star Trek Next Generation, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Star Trek Voyager, Star Trek The Experience. All the movies were had Star Trek in them. And the feeling was that since we were going to name this Enterprise, which I don't know who came up with that title, but the idea that who on earth would not know that a TV show that had to do with, even if they didn't know it had to do with space, a TV show called Enterprise it's a pretty easy bet that it's a Star Trek show. But uh, the network, uh, after a couple of years, <laughs> decided that uh, For Star Trek. the way to help the ratings was to throw the word Star Trek onto the front of it. So I can represent Enterprise, and you can represent Star, Star, Star Trek, Trek Enterprise. Enterprise. Of course, it only got good once it was called Star Trek Enterprise. Exactly. No, it only got good with Manny. Manny Cotto. Of course, Man the Man Manny Cotto season. Right. Manny Cotto <laughs> saved, the, saved the show. So it, it was, We were just there setting up setting up three years for Manny to come in, and uh, he and, and he blew it. It's interesting, Rick. I was in London for this big Star Trek convention that they were doing there. I, I turned it into a little bit of a vacation. But I, what was interesting, it was a rather large one, you know, tens of thousands of people. What was interesting was, from my per perception, people had the most questions about Enterprise and people were most interested in that show. Like that show had a huge following there. More, more so than any, most Star Trek conventions here seem to be next generation oriented or whatnot. But Enterprise was hugely popular at the Star Trek convention. It had a big presence there. And there was no, I hate to use the word stigma, but Enterprise came under a tremendous amount of scrutiny. And it was a great show. I'm more proud of a lot of the work we did on Enterprise than than any of the other Star yeah, Trek shows. I, if I've, you look back at it, it's a it's it's, a, it's kind of a, it's a, a, the pilot. I think. Or I, I mean, I hate to. I don't want to sound self-aggrandizing, but I I think it's the best Star Trek pilot all around. Maybe in part because the people making it had been there a while and they'd worked on all of them and had perfected what they were doing. I don't know, but it's. What yeah, do you, what do you think? Well, it was the first pilot that that opened with a cornfield shot. Right. That has a lot to do with it. Or did it? No, it, it opened with a. I think it, it opened with a kid painting uh, a, the, a model. The kid painting yeah. the model. Archer and his father. No, I, I I thought the pilot was was terrific. The job of doing a pilot is you've got to you've got to introduce eight or nine people. Uh, you have to in a way introduce the relationships they have with one another what their backstory is, why they are brought together, what they're going to be doing in the course of 100 episodes or, or, or more. Uh, and I think we managed to bring together um, a, a group of wonderful actors, wonderful actors. One of the things I'm most proud of has been the casting. I think that uh, forgetting the Patrick Stewart's and the Brent Spiner's and the people that get all the accolades, uh, people like uh, Sadig, uh, people like uh, Colomini, uh, Rene, I was going to say Echeverria, Rene Abourgeois. Um, we've had some, uh, <clears throat> just some really remarkable people who have come in and, and played these roles. People, John Billingsley. Uh, Dominic Keating, we I, we put together a great cast. Yeah, we did, and you know, for me, this was the first show I was involved with from the ground up. 
I mean, I was around for Voyager, but I, I didn't cast the other shows, and I wasn't involved in the conception of this. So it was a very new experience for me, and it seemed to me that Enterprise was cast very easily. I mean, we had trouble finding Jolene's character. You know, that, that I think maybe it was the last person cast, and it's always it's all usually difficult to cast the ingenue who can who you know playing a Vulcan who can act and all, whatnot. But it seemed easy. Was it compared to the other shows? I mean, Billingsley walked in the door as you might recall, and he did an audition, and that was that. We knew he was the guy. And his performance in the audition is identical to the scene in the show. He just... Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I remember Connor. I mean, we it, we didn't... It wasn't a struggle. It, how did it compare to the other... I, I remember Dominic Keating had come in to read for a role in an episode of Voyager, and uh, he got done, and I, I went to Junie, and I said, we have created a character named Malcolm in, uh, in Enterprise, and we, we, we can't put this guy in Voyager. So tell him he's not getting the job, but we've got something bigger for him waiting. Interesting. And, 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 he, was, uh, and, and he was terrific. It, the, the casting was good. Casting the, the beautiful woman in a show is always a bitch. I remember it was it was very hard on uh, on on Deep Space Nine because we had to find a woman who was not only uh, beautiful and a good actor, but who also had the wisdom of somebody who was supposed to be like hundreds of years old. When, when Jolene came in, she kind of uh, she kind of nailed it. Ray, can I let me? There are a couple of things I want to, if you recall, a couple of things I want to try to. I I may be misremembering. Oh, I do nothing but misremember. Okay, well, maybe we'll misremember together. But when we first talked about the show, weren't we talking initially about doing something that was purely a prequel? There was no futuristic element initially. Uh, there was no temporal Cold War that was added later in the development process. And something even more grounded, did we at one time talk about setting part of the first season on Earth with the construction of the first ship and, and really like launching that ship and doing something that, that's quite frankly scared the studio? They wanted something set in the future, first of all. They wanted something that set in Next Generation's time. And a prequel made them nervous, and doing something too prequely made them, they made them yeah. even more nervous. You, is, am I right about remembering I, that? I, you, you are right, because I remember at one point one of the studio people saying, this prequel idea is really cool, but maybe we should save that for the next one. <laughs> they said, why don't you go like do the opposite? Go like to the 26th century right. or something like that. And our response was, so the spandex is a little tighter. The ships will go warp 14. Uh, what, the phasers what, what, are smaller. Yeah. Yeah, what, what, is, what is more future than the 24th century? The, yeah, there was definite... The, the, the idea of people wearing jeans and didn't we have, I, I, now this, these are all things that are just coming to me. I think we actually wrote scenes that took place in Chinatown in, in, in what's almost the present. I think you're right. Oh my God, I forgot about that. I, so, so did I. Yeah. And, and they, they didn't. Uh, yeah, they, they weren't into it. Yeah. We, we did make it, we, we, and we ended up, in the pilot, making a reference where uh, Phlox talks about how much he loves the Chinese food. Chinese food on Earth. That, yeah. In San Francisco, because that's where because that's where Starfleet is. Right. Because I remember talking about setting again in, in the development stages, people in the mud on Earth, building the starship, get, you know, getting ready to to be the first people out there and I, I have a, an emotional recollection of being disappointed that we weren't being permitted to go as far as back as we wanted to go and sensing from the studio, rightly or wrongly, that they never really fu fully endorsed the idea, that they were tolerating the prequel idea and they kind of forced us to become, forced us into creating the Temporal Cold War, which by the way is a cool idea in its own right. And, 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 and in a way, the show became a prequel and a sequel because if you, the Temple Cold War took place in the 29th century. So they kind of got what they wanted. 
Well, we also had something that I don't think, I can't think of any other television show that had, which was our, our, our pizza development lunches with Carrie in my office. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. So here's, here's Carrie McCluggage, who's like the chairman of Paramount Television, a big shot, who said, do you guys mind if I come in and sit in on some of these early, early development meetings? Yeah, I forgot about this. And I had, a, I had a, like a table in my office, big table, glass top table, and Carrie would come, come in. And this was not the kind of guy who'd come to your office. This was the kind of guy you would go to his office. Um, He'd come into the office, he'd take his jacket off, because he always wore a suit, he'd roll his sleeves up, and he'd sit down at the table and we would eat pizza, and uh, we would talk development of, of Enterprise. Yeah, I completely forgot that that happened. You're absolutely right. Yeah, that was weird. But I think the, the key to the development of, of Enterprise, to me, had to do with first contact, because First Contact, which had been done in whatever year it was done, it was, I guess, uh, 96. 96. We based somewhat on, uh, on, on canon, Star Trek canon, which is something that Manny respects and Brandon and I don't. <laughs> R rumor has it. I'm being facetious. Uh, we, we had... Uh, a, a kind of a post-apocalyptic earth where things were a mess and we had James Cromwell uh, as an alcoholic uh, scientist and he creates the first warp drive uh, and this is all connected with a story having to do with uh, our next generation characters uh, finding a way to go back in time to save save the world, which, which is what every movie was about. The idea that in the 21st century, which I think we, I think it was the late 21st century that Zephram Cochran invents warp drive. Mm -hmm. And then the 23rd century, you've got, uh, you've got Kirk and Spock and, uh, and, and, and a perfect Earth and Starfleet and the Federation and, uh, and, and these huge uh, spaceships with hundreds of people on board. What happened between those two things? What happened between first contact when we, when, when we first meet an alien, the Vulcans, at the very, very end? You wrote it, you should remember it. Um, what happened between that and Kirk when there were hundreds of, of worlds that they were traveling? And we thought, what a great idea it would be to find a spot somewhere in between when man was nervous, uh, uh, tenuous. The, the whole idea of going out into space uh, was something that the Vulcans kept telling us we weren't ready for. Uh, and to see the first starship. So the thought was, well, a ship that has a warp one or warp two capability could only get to a tiny little bit of the galaxy and maybe find one or two planets that had human beings on it. But if we could start the series at a time where, like warp five had been developed, that would truly open up the quadrant to space travelers, that that would be a great time to see the first humans that went out into space. Uh, so I think that that was, that was the premise that kind of got it, all, got it all going, that feeling of what happened between that muddy world where everybody was living in first contact on Earth uh, and the, the world of Kirk and Spock, which was just a couple hundred years later. Yeah, it, 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 it sounds great hearing you describe, <laughs> describe it. It was a great inspiration. And I think there were some inventions. My, one of my favorite, if not my favorite invention in the show, which turned out to be very controversial with fans, was that the Vulcans were antagonistic. That they 
were, you know, may, they seemed great when they walked off the ship in first contact, but it would be a tumultuous relationship with the humans because they felt that they knew best. And they were, we, they, they didn't think we were ready. Perhaps we weren't ready. Because one of the great things in the pilot I love is it's a really simple premise that we have to take a Klingon back to his home world. And we lose him. <laughs> like in the first leg of the journey, he's kidnapped. And that we have a, because of her scientific knowledge of space maps and things like that, we have this chick who is not only a Vulcan, but even has more of a sense of disgust for humans than any of the other Doesn't like the way they smell. Doesn't like the way they eat. Doesn't like their attitude. Uh, and she is uh, assigned to join the ship. So one of these antagonistic, uh, um, one of these antagonistic Vulcans ends up uh, coming on board. And then we have our normal complement of, of humans. Uh, but it was great because, like Hoshi, uh, there was no such thing as a universal uh, translator. And Hoshi was just a, 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 a linguist with a great ear. And he has to go down to South America or somewhere and talk her into coming on board Mal the ship. Or that Malibu. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was Malibu, but it was supposed to be South America. Whenever you see jungle, it's, it's always Malibu. <laughs> then we decided to put a alien that we had never seen before, which was Phlox, on the ship. And Travis Montgomery, who played the role, he, I thought this was a great idea. I, I, th I think this was your idea. He was a, a boomer, we called him. And he was like a, he was, he was in like a warp one ship. He grown up his whole Born in a ship, never been life, to Earth. Being somebody who, who's, like he came from a family that were like, transport people they they were they were like f worked on space freighters and dealt with a tiny little part of the galaxy because they uh, barely could go warp one but he had uh, he had been to other planets he had he had seen other species uh, now Phlox I don't know how, how Phlox was I think Phlox was brought to earth by the by the Vulcans mm-hmm because he was there to take care of uh, Tiny. Remember? Tiny, yeah. What was his name? Tiny Lister. Though there's some things that you think are cool when you first create a show, like the Space Boomer idea. That didn't really go anywhere. I think we did one Space Boomer episode, but what sounded good on paper, born and raised in space, never been to Earth, what's their perspective? When everyone gets on a ship week to week, it's kind of like who cares what the boomer has to say, <laughs> you know. And the same thing was true. It's like we ca we came up, the, we had a great come kind of James Bondy sort of line. Malcolm gives Archer these a box with two guns in it, and he said these are called phase pistols. Mm -hmm. They've got two settings, and one is called stun, and the other is kill. Be careful that you don't know. get them confused. So it, it was a great line, but the point is, is that in the in the course of the episode, he uses the phaser. And once that's done, it's done. <laughs> the novelty's gone. Right. And it was the same thing about in, in, in the pilot. And transporters had never, ever been used for anything biological before. They were just used for, for transporting equipment. And uh, there's a scene between Trip and uh, Malcolm where they talk about the fact that this thing is, can, can, can have a... Uh, biological matter transported and it's like the big gag about what well, he's someone says yeah well you mean fruits fruits and vegetables and 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 his answer i think is no you know they mean uh, science officers and, mm -hmm. and and weapons officers or whatever but it's used to, to beam archer back on board mm -hmm. the ship well, that's the gag. The gag's over then, and, right? <laughs> well, it's the, the same thing. I mean, it's like we never did. Pe people are no longer really afraid of the transporter. Yeah, it's been and I don't think we we never really used the transporter. We always took these shuttle pods, which we spent a lot of money on. Um, so we we never really used it again. I don't think. But uh, or no, there was a kind of a dreadful episode where the guy who invented trans a Manicoto episode, where a guy 
There's no such thing as a dreadful man code <laughs> episode. <laughs> the inventor of the transporter came on board. And all I remember is it just it turned out terribly. One of the great pleasures of working on the show for me was was writing with you, Rick. I it was a, a, the pilot of Enterprise was the first time we'd written anything together, and it went really well. And I think one of the episodes that really captured the spirit of the show best was a very simple episode, which is called Shuttle, Shuttle Pod, Pod Two, Shuttle Pod One, or One or Two, or whatever. and. Uh, because it really captured the feeling of two guys in space, and they they were afraid. They they were they were anxious. They were brave. They were a lot of the things. It was, it was you, also an episode that could have been done on a stage. Yeah, it was literally two, it was two guys. All we know, those actors are taking it on. I've taken it on the road. <laughs> <laughs> but but there were emotions in there that Star Trek characters just didn't normally have about being out there. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I thought that was was really uh, successful. And there were there were episodes like that. There, it, we I remember we had problems even back in the Next Generation days where um, we had this very futuristic computer that sat on uh, on on Picard's desk, and then Steve Jobs comes out with a computer that's much cooler and much more streamlined, and so how can we say that this is something that's 400 years in the future when something is available at Best Buy that looks more futuristic? Same thing with the communicator. Uh, you know, Kirk and Spock had these flip phones that nobody, nobody would even use today. <laughs> so we, you, you had to come up with something that was futuristic but it couldn't be more futuristic. It had to be futuristic for today, for the audience, but it couldn't be more futuristic than Kirk and Spock or Picard. And we had already passed that point, so it, 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 made, it, very, it made it very difficult. It did, but I thought Enterprise was very successful in that it had a nuts and bolts quality to it. I mean, we t took it to, I think it was your idea, or Herman Zimmerman, our production designer, I designer's idea to tour a nuclear submarine and make the show a little more cramped. I love that in Arch's ready room, he has to duck under, he always had to duck under a beam. So I, I thought, I, I honestly thought we got it right. Some fans might have disagreed, but I, the, the general feeling of the ship I thought was right. Of course, you look today at J.J. Abrams' prequel ship and it, it's like something out of, you know, it's so advanced looking to me anyway, um, the bridge. I, th I, thought we, I thought we nailed it. No, I think we made the bridge very nuts and bolts. I, I love the fact that the ready room was... It, the ready room was something we got out of the submarine. When we went to the submarine, we went down, you, me, and uh, uh, Herman, and we went down to San Diego, and we got onto a, a small nuclear submarine. It never left port, but we spent... Uh, they, they let us see everything except the nuclear reactor. <laughs> nuclear reactor was off limits. But uh, I remember there was a bank of computers, and the guy who was running the computers on the submarine, the sailor, said, none of these are more, he says, these were all built in the 70s, and he says, none of these computers are as powerful as a Palm Pilot. <laughs> oh, yes, the Palm Pilot. <laughs> yeah. But then we went to, we went, the captain took us into his um, quarters, and his quarters were like six feet by eight feet and his ready room was sort of like a little alcove with a, with a desk <laughs> and so Herman kind of using that decided to make Archer's ready room I mean Picard's ready room was this you know he had a fish tank he had a fish tank. He had paintings on the walls. He had big, uh, uh, big tables that people could sit and have meetings at. Um, we made we made it much more like, uh, uh, and we did much more like the submarine. And we didn't have any paintings on the wall of space, which I always found odd. It would be like being on a sailing ship having pictures of the ocean. <laughs> pictures of the ocean. No, actually, we did have in the in Archer's ready room. There were drawings, black and white yeah. drawings, uh, of but w what they were is they were of all the different enterprises. So there was the 
the, the, the 18th century sailing ship, the Enterprise. There was the aircraft carrier, the Enterprise. And then there was, I think, spaceships. You know, do you know, Rick, I, I took that. Did you? Yeah, I have that. Uh, I'm going to be talking to <laughs> legal Paramount about legal. that. It was the only, it was, I, it was the, uh, su I, I don't know how I got it, but I always loved that. I always loved that piece. Um, and by the way, I got three grand for it on eBay. <laughs> okay. Did you take anything from the show? Oh, so much. No, I, I, oddly enough, I never would take anything. I, Herman would always have a thing. I'm so, somebody would come over and just Give deliver, something. deliver something and just to drop it off. So I, I have a couple of little knickknacks. Yeah, I, I, I'm regretful I didn't even take from the other shows. I, I have nothing. Not so much as a phaser, you know? You can't imagine what the actors have. Oh, really? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Patrick Stewart has some good stuff. Another thing that I was grilled over the coals about uh, to this day was the was uh, the theme song for the, <laughs> for, for the opening credits, and uh, I, I I can't blame Brandon. I can blame Brandon for a lot of things. I don't think I can blame Brandon for that. But I we had had. The original series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, all of the movies, they all had these big sweeping uh, orchestral Star Trek scores that all had that one major theme to them and then other things that were added on. And I just thought, wouldn't it be cool if we're doing something new and doing something different, let's find a song that would be appropriate that we could put over an opening credit that would show, using visual effects and artwork that would show the, the history of flight. Uh, and even before that, the history of the sailing ship, the Enterprise, and then uh, all of the early uh, Chuck Yeager and all these, and Peter Lauritsen and, and whoever worked on putting together the opening credit sequence, of that is, I mean, it reminds me of like Homeland today has a sequence similar to that. Uh, it, it was a beautiful montage. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have a song? And we interviewed a number of people and uh, we finally met with... Diane Warren. Diane Warren. And she had written this song previously, and she had this British uh, opera singer who was also a pop singer, and I, I I thought the song fit perfectly into what the show was about, what it meant, and I thought it would be kind of cool to, to do a song. And boy, <laughs> did the fans hate that. And then we did, I remember at one point, the studio didn't like it much either, and they, at one point they, they had us add some like they had to speed it up a little bit and add some drums to make it a little bit <laughs> hipper, and then I think finally we lost the lyrics and it just became the music. I don't I don't remember what, but it was uh, it, it, it was a bust. <laughs> it's uh, you know do you remember for the longest time when we were creating the imagery and I think it was a title house that specialized in creating title sequences. Yes, right, I don't remember who did it, but they were great. Um, there was a U2 song in there for, for months that we got really used to because it was cool. I think it was a beautiful day. Yeah. And, um, of course, we never would have been able to afford licensing that if they even agreed to it, you know. But I, I always thought that that would have been, would have been a if good If it song. hadn't been U2, they would have hated it just as much. Yeah, like the, the, that's the, true. The, it, the, I think the, just the, in, conce in concept, the song threw people off, you know. But I listened to it recently. I still don't think it was that bad. I think it was kind of cool. It was too. It was, I think it was too much of a departure for people, for the, so. for the opening credits. No, it's it's the, the the only the only thing I didn't like about the song was the orchestra the orchestrated version at the end credits. I thought they kind of took it too far in the um, elevator music <laughs> direction. If you even remember those. Yeah, that was oh. Dennis did that. That was part of uh, um, that was part of the score of the show, but. It was sort of a sullen version of the song. Yeah. Sad version of the song. Of course, there was a Manny Cotto episode where, 
<laughs> which was a Mirror Universe episode where he got rid of the song. <laughs> they were at a, they got a little badass uh, military uh, version of, of, the, of the show. I'm trying to think of wh- if there were any other difficult aspects of creating the show. I know that the writing was a, was a challenge um, in the first season. I had a lot of trouble getting the right mix of writers. Most of the writers who we had kind of carried along with us uh, and had worked their way up the ladder from the various shows had all gone off in, into different places. And you had this sort of awesome responsibility of trying to uh, trying to put together a whole new But it was staff. as you, well, we both did, really. And as you can attest, having been there from the beginning, for whatever reason, I don't know, maybe it's, Maybe it's me. It seemed to me that it was just hard to find people who could get Star Trek, the voice of Star Trek, right. It was so spe- it was so specific, it, and yet not. It was a str- it's a strange. It's like writing a period piece in a funny way, but it's the near it's the future, um, and it has it it has science in it. It does whether it's real or not. It's got to sound real, and that takes a certain knack, and it's got a hokiness to it. Which is natural when you've got people wearing weird rubber faces. But the hope, but you know what? The key is to take it seriously, even though it, it still may come off as hokey at times. Well, I think, and the I think story, we the, always did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, I think it's, there's definitely a mainstream. I remember I was, out, I was dating a woman who, during Next Generation, who had never seen the show, and she said regarding Worf, why does he look like an animal? People just, if you didn't know Star Trek, it must have just seemed like this weird very strange thing. Yeah. But at the same time, as I've always said, the greatest satisfaction that I ever got out of doing all of these series was how many people would come to you and say how much it meant to you. It, it, it meant to them. Yeah. That, that how many people would say, this is the only appointment television we have in our week and the family sits down and watches it and then we discuss it afterwards and it, it was it was a big responsibility for us in a, in, in a funny way because people took this yeah rick i gotta tell you it's hard for me to imagine you doing a star trek convention um almost impossible to imagine however i know you've done them i did two you did two exactly two one of course at royal albert hall i guess it would have to be the right venue for you that's true um but uh well one was because Roddenberry was supposed to do it, but he passed away, and I did that one. And then the second one was the Royal Albert Hall. But it's—I don't know if you experienced this, but I do—I do one, maybe one a year for usually just the one in Vegas because it's close and it's Vegas. But interacting with the fans uh, is uh, that kind of experience. You know, a lot of them are don't have much to say or ask the questions you might expect. But there are that handful of pe- the, the, those people. Who have you? The, the the show has moved in some very deep. But way. don't you don't you fear running into all those people who think that you and I are the are, are the, are the, Killed Star the Trek. devil incarnate? Uh, it, it crosses my mind. But it, you don't run into them. You don't have people attack you. Oh no 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 one's attacked me. Oh there's been some nasty. I mean verbally so, attacking. You, you know in person people are generally different than they are behind their keyboards when nobody knows you know their true identity. I, I find people are generally, but you know, it's it's entirely possible. I have had a couple moments, more, in, 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 I've been recognized probably exactly twice in my entire life in public, but both times it was unnerving, because I was alone. I was not in a place where there were a lot of people, and someone was said, "Are you are you Brandon Braga?" And that's not it's not a good thing when you look behind you and it's the greatest answer to that question is no. Is no, <laughs> that's absolutely right. I've had start as recently as this past Labor Day. I had Star Trek fans show up at my house. I was sitting by the pool. My family was there. We were barbecuing, and my my nephew comes out and says, "There are two men, two men at the door for you. One black guy, one white guy." And he said, "One's wearing a suit." And I said, "Well, who are they?" And he says, "I don't know." And of course, in my parent, I'm thinking, "Are they cops? What have I done? <laughs> what have I done?" But uh, I go out there. I sent them. <laughs> But they were Star Trek fans, and they had found my address on the internet. And my house is not has no protection whatsoever. I shouldn't be saying this uh, on tape, but 
they could find my, they found my address and they wanted autographs and say hello. And it turned out to be this one guy has showed me these pictures. He's like a collector of Star Trek things. He has the shuttle pod in his garage. That not the, the, the hero one, the one with all the, the inside, he has it in his garage, he, along he, with his SUV. Did he, <laughs> buy, did he buy it in the, au in he, the auction, he, or did he, bought he steal it, it? He bought it from like a, uh, a prop house for like $25,000. And he's got it, he, he's restored it. The electronics work, and it's next, I sort of got it's next to his, like his minivan in, <laughs> in his garage. And that's where that ended up, that thing. That's, uh... <laughs> I'm not sure if that, I'm not sure how to feel about that. Yeah, it's not at the Smithsonian, let's put it that way. <laughs> I was now I was home with a with a woman, a, a, an Italian astronomer. I don't know if you remember her. I do. You, you remember her? Mm -hmm. And uh, my phone rang, and some voice on the phone said, "Look out! Look outside your window." And my house. And I looked outside. They hung up, and my house had been toilet papered. It it must have been someone I knew, or not. I don't know. But it was a good toilet paper job. And it was right around time. And we got some, uh, Ron Moore and I got some death threats on the phone, I think. At was work. this for gen Generations? This was around the time, this was during the first couple weeks of the release of Generations, that people were upset about Kirk. I still get asked about that. I, it's, I, I, I find it so strange because people talk about the fact that, that I or we were responsible for killing Kirk and how could we have done that? And... Um, it, it was such a logical thing. I mean, we sat down to write this movie and at the story stage of the movie and the feeling was that the studio didn't want us to have any of the original series people in it at all. They, it was the next generation movie. And we thought we should pay homage to these guys. These, this, we should somehow pass the torch. And well, how the hell do you do that with the, when you've got you know, I mean, Kirk's been dead for, Kirk is, is I, I don't know if he's ever mentioned in Next Generation. Is he, is he mentioned? No, I don't think so. I think you guys were pretty cognizant to kind of keep them separate, those yeah. shows. So, Until, you know, Scotty would make an appearance, but no, no I don't think so. Well, we, we had, uh, DeForest Kelly was in the pilot. The, the pilot, so he was, but that was because he had lived to be like 200 or something like that. But Kirk was obviously dead. Uh, by the time we got to Generations. Uh, and all I thought was, what if we bring him back to life and have him die again, but in a way that's going to save Earth or save a planet or, or whatever? We, in a, we were resurrecting him by creating this whole ribbon idea and then having him die at well, the it's, end. It's actually, it's actually, you bring up a point I've never considered, which is that he was already dead. It's like, it's actually a great point. We didn't kill Kirk. Kirk died. We resurrected him and killed and, and put, took him out of a temporal well, anomaly. Well, we resurrected and, him and let him give his life towards saving uh, the entire inhabitants of a planet. Yeah, the two, yeah. And we were accused of, ki of, 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 killing, of killing Kirk. Yeah, it's actually, it's actually not true. I've never thought about it that way before. We're accused of, of killing the franchise, Rick. I mean, there is That's a, true. There is well, a, I was accused accused of, of killing uh, uh, Data in in the movie Nemesis, where in fact Brent Spiner co story specifically credit. specifically stated that he would not do the movie <laughs> unless he died at the end. That was a provision right. of his being involved in the film. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I I stand by. Enterprise a thousand percent. I wish I think the show should have continued. I, I'm not afraid to say I don't think the network got the show and I don't think they were behind the show. I think they were somewhat hostile to, toward the show. Um, I don't think they're going to be very hostile toward Star Trek when they resurrect the next series. They're going to make a lot of money. But I don't, I didn't feel that that it, that it was a welcome, welcoming place for the show and the show ended before it should have ended. Well, we during during Voyager and uh and, and Enterprise, we dealt with uh, th at least three completely different administrations at, at the network. Uh, and the first two were uh, very supportive. 
And then a whole new group of people came in. Uh, there was some degree of hostility. I think a lot of the hostility had to do with the fact that they had been told that we had been given carte blanche for for 16 years, mm -hmm. and they were not about to buy into that, and Absolutely. that we didn't take notes, mm -hmm. and they weren't about to buy into that. The first real notes meetings we would have were with this regime. I'm not going to name any names, but some of the notes were some of the worst notes I've ever heard. Because the network was getting younger and younger, and they were really trying to to deal with an audience of, of, of young women, young girls, uh, it was seriously suggested to us that in the mess hall we have a... A band playing. Oh, wait. A band of young, young, but, but, young but guys. The, but they also were like, and maybe a different group every week. Like, they can get the hottest... We're, we're going to get the hottest young bands out there. And we were like, where are we going to put them? Well, you have that restaurant on the ship, don't you? I don't... They didn't know what it was called. They didn't... I think I used... I was trying to pitch a story for the season. I used the word hull. They didn't know what a hull oh, was. was. We, that, that's, that's one of my favorite stories. Tell we, me, because I don't remember it. We were pitching this story. Uh, again, I won't mention any names, <laughs> but we're dealing with, with one of the highest ranking people at this network. And we're explaining how we are writing an episode where there's a fire out on the hull and the guys have to get into spacesuits and walk out on the hull of the ship and they and they they go across the hull and they have to put this fire out and one of them da 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 and they're all there's like five of them sitting around the table and they're all nodding and kind of kind of is going that's great and then this one person in question one of the highest, if not the highest ranking person in the room, said, I just have one question. What's a hull? <laughs> and that, I said, you know, it's the, it's the outside of the ship. It's the, the... But that, that to me, as ludicrous and funny as it sounds, it wasn't particularly funny at the time because it was a different... You know, the most I could say, it was a different feeling. We had... In large part, thanks to you, Rick, the, the efficient, successful production that you had set up, the architecture of this modern day Star Trek that you had established and sustained, which is, you know, I find it funny that the people who say that you were in part responsible for killing the franchise built the franchise. It's easy to remember the good times, I suppose. And that thing lasts forever. It used to say even Gunsmoke was canceled. You know, mm -hmm. it's like who was responsible for the death of Gunsmoke? Who was running the? Who was running Gunsmoke at the time Gunsmoke went down? Who, who was killed running, Bonanza? Who killed Bonanza? What about I Love Lucy? How about the Andy Griffith show? The show was on for a collectively eighteen years. Mm -hmm. Nothing lasts forever. And I'm not saying that we. But no, co collectively it was no, not collectively. It was eighteen years, but there were twenty five seasons because right. seven of those years had two two shows. That's on. right. So collectively twenty five years. And I got to tell you, I can't look to Enterprise, and I'm sure there will still be fans that disagree. I cannot, and I'm not saying there weren't problems with the show. And I'll take a, a blame for, especially that first season. When I was struggling personally to try to to get the find the voice of the show, the show was a good show, and the most I'll say for for those crazy network people who just didn't understand it, it did push us to some degree. When we were called into Jonathan Dolgen's office to say, you know, what the f are you going to do with the show? What are you going to do that's different next year? We did a third season, which I thought was one of the best seasons of Star Trek I've ever been part of. It, the Zindi thing. There were science fiction ideas in there that I thought were just great. I thought it was a really successful season of television. You know, it's, I've seen, I made the mistake of reading some of these bulletin postings. I don't anymore, but there was a time when I oh, did. Oh, sure you do. <laughs> well, no, no <laughs> sure I don't, because do. they're not writing about me, Rick. They're not <laughs> they were writing something I would. But the, t but the times, and there was a point where because in my much, much smaller way, was there when Next Generation was ascending into this phenomenon. And I read a few posts saying, you know, if you really look back at Braga's episodes, they, they sucked. They actually weren't that great. So you just can't, it's like revisionist history. Do you know what I'm saying? A, a, a psychologist would love to get a hold of both of us because back in the early days when we would get these things, 
whenever anybody wrote something good about us, we would ignore it. We would just, <laughs> all we would do is we would just look for the people who would say horrible things, and and and, and we would sit and, and, and fret. <laughs> it's yeah. I mean, we were Star Trek was there for the transition from uh, fan mail, which I don't think we really read, and the internet. Where well, I, I was explaining that you used to uh, send me over. You'd have your assistant send me over uh, like Xeroxed printed pages off of a, a computer or something like that of, of fan right. comments about the show. Yeah, no, I rem yeah, I remember that. It was so new at the time. Um, it was it was immediate feedback. And now today you, you, you go on to these sites and they'll, they'll tell you what the actors in, in J.J. Abrams movie had for lunch. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they need content. But it was, you know, it was not, I don't, I don't want to ne dwell on the negative, but it, it was not, it's, it's just not fun to think of yourself as the person who was responsible for killing the franchise, but it's just so ridiculous. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. Because, and I'll tell you, if Enterprise really sucked, if you look back at that show and said, oh my God, maybe I could, maybe I could see, but the writing was on the wall. I'm not making excuses. The ratings were, the ratings of, of Star Trek were steadily, you know, they weren't, they're with, I think it started actually on Voyager. It started on Deep Space Nine. Oh, Deep Space Nine numbers started falling, then Voyager's numbers started falling. They all decayed. And uh, you can, you can come up with any one of a million, not a million, but you can come up with any one of a dozen reasons for why this happened. I gotta tell you, the, the two most common questions I get probably about Star Trek are, what do you think makes Star Trek so enduring and popular? And why do you think Star Trek got canceled? What, what, what happened? And you can't ask both, really. It's gonna kind of- Also, kind I of, think, you know, a, a show that runs four full seasons, um, it's not a failure. I mean, most te most television shows don't run once one season, and few run two. It was, com it's, but it's being compared, of course, to to the ones that ran seven. Yeah. The original ran three, four, three, three, and they tried to cancel it after the first year, and then they tried to cancel it again after the second year, and they managed, and then they successfully canceled it after the third year. But we had the only reason they canceled Next Generation after seven years was because of the actors' deals were getting too expensive, and uh, they wanted to do a movie. So they decided that would be the seven-year thing. And then Deep Space Nine and Voyager both ran seven years. Let me, I wanted to ask you something, because I can't really remember. Speaking of the original series, we were going to do a two-part Kirk episode on Enterprise. Do you remember this? Oh, I remember it very well. Because, and I, I remember... Having lunch, we went to lunch on Melrose Avenue, and we brought Ago. Man, we brought Ago, and we brought Manny with us. Right, and he he was like, <laughs> Man, Manny had never met we Manny had never met Bill Shatner, and he could not believe he was having lunch with Bill Shatner. It was it was so great. But what do you remember? What yes, I, remember. I can't remember what the idea of the episode was. I remember you and I taking long walks on the beach in Malibu talking about this what the story for Kirk would be I cannot remember well, the it, story Do you Shatner, remember it? the reason that we went to have lunch was cuz Bill had called and said he had this great idea it was Bill's storyline and I do not remember it at all oh. but it was it was fine and uh, without getting into specifics uh, I well I, I'll I'll make an I'll make an analogy when we did the movie Generations, uh, we had this character named Soren, who was the bad guy, who was, uh, um, I guess it got out to the, to the casting people around that we were doing the Star Trek movie and that there was a bad guy in it. And I got a call saying that Marlon Brando was interested in playing the role. <laughs> And I just couldn't believe it. And I was so excited. And I was so, I mean, oh, Jesus, Martin, great. Who cares how fat he is? <laughs> and I went to see the president of the studio. And I said, Marlon Brando wants to play Soren. 
And there was, the response was, what does he want? And I remember the president of the studio just laughing at me. And that was the end of that. Well, here we had Shatner at the height of, of a time where it would have been great to, to do a two-part weird time travel kind of Kirk thing. And he had actually worked out a whole... Uh, he had worked out a whole storyline. And we sat down at this restaurant. At, I remember at the window table. And he told us the story, and we thought it was great. And I got back to my office, and his agent called me. And I, I, don't, I don't even think he had an agent at the time. I think it was like his lawyer. I might be wrong. And said, Bill wants X number of dollars to do this. And it, this, this number was, it, it, it was so ridiculous. It was, uh, there's a thing in television called called the top of the top of the show, which is the most you pay a guest actor. And this was like 20 times higher than that. <laughs> and I called McCluggage and I mentioned it to McCluggage and he laughed the same way <laughs> I had been, gotten the Marlon Brando laugh about it. And in doing an interview recently with, with Bill, he said to me, you know, I, uh, I came up with this great two-part episode and I pitched it to you guys and I just never heard from you again about it. <laughs> and I said, Bill, that's not the way it was. It was you wanted an obscene amount of money to do it and the studio said no. Everybody remembers things differently. Yeah, they do. That's too bad. It would have been, it actually, unlike the Brando thing, I think it would have been good for the show. Yeah. But in a funny way, I understand it. You know, when Shatner plays a role, it's one thing. When Shatner plays Kirk, I guess it's a different number, you know. It's true. It's a shame, too, because I don't know that he'll ever play Kirk again. That would have been the, probably the last time. Well, he's uh, he's 81 years old. But he, he looks amazing. He I mean, he's great, it's yeah. incredible, really. I flew back from London with next to him on the plane. And where he's this guy, he just has unbelief, unrelenting energy. Oh, yeah. He was up the whole flight. I I slept for most of the flight, and he he just sat up and read. I I he's and he's completely lucid. I mean, he's like he's he's actually it's kind of amazing. We we should all be so lucky at age eighty one. Be lucky just to get to age yeah, eighty one. No, no kidding. But one of the things that I may be misremembering, but I believe. And maybe I'm just making this up. Future guy from the Temporal Cold War. We had thrown around a lot of ideas about who Future guy is going to be a Romulan, but I thought the most interesting idea that we came up with was that it was going to be Archer himself, mm -hmm. and an Archer from a some sort of terrible future where he, in some way, was responsible for doing something wrong. With it, but he's manipulating himself. And if you go back and look, it, it could very well have been Archer. Um, well, the idea in, in, in the pilot, we have this character who we learn is from the future. We also learn that this character is using the Suliban, that this character is somehow giving the Suliban the technology to alter themselves genetically uh, to serve future guy's purpose, whatever that is. And right now, in the pilot, I think future guy wanted to create tumult within the Klingon Empire. That's right. To, which all had to do with the message that, uh, uh, that, that Klang, what in was his DNA. It was in his DNA. He was Klang, in, yeah. in his DNA. Um, and for reasons that obviously were, nobody knew, uh, somebody from the future who only could be communicated in this strange chamber on board the, uh, the Suliban vessel uh, was giving them instructions and w wanted 
the Klingon Empire to destroy, to destroy themselves. And this was, in our minds, I think this was all part of some bizarre master plan that was happening way in the future. And we never called this guy future guy. Somebody, some fan started calling him future guy. And then there was questions of, is, could, could future guy be Archer? Could future guy be... Uh, People were hoping he was a Romulan, because Romulans hadn't made an appearance yeah. yet. J.J. Um, Abrams was one of the things that people yeah, thought. thought it'd be J.J. But uh, uh, it, 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 we, we, in fact, never fleshed it out. We were, well, we never got a chance to. I mean, we had a lot of ideas, and I thought, you know, Manny in season four kind of set the Temple Cold War aside as best I could, you know, I guess he wasn't that interested in it. But, uh, and it did get kind of convoluted, but I was... I was disappointed that we were never able to do that. I wanted to take Archer to the 29th century. I think we may have discussed that at some point. The whole concept of the... When we put those three words together, temporal Cold War, there was something really cool about the possibilities, about a, a, a kind of a stagnant warlike situation that existed in time as opposed to uh, um, you know it would be a better show in a contemporary way in other words and I think we talked about that for fun the temper time travel was we learned was invented in 1996 and some terrible accident happened that none of us know about and the nations that invented it three, four nations secretly did a temporal accord never to use it again, but they're all paranoid, so they all have agents in the 1950s. You could do a Cold War within a Cold War. The Russians and the Americans are, have, both have agents from 2013 in the 50s. You could do some really postmodern kind of thing with the temporal Cold War. Do you remember the book, the novelization of the Enterprise pilot in hardcover that came out around the time the show did by Diane Carey that it was very obvious in reading many passages that she hated the pilot script and, and <laughs> was making her own meta commentary on the show. Do you remember this? I vaguely do, yeah. Uh, there are set, there, it's filled with passages commenting on how the script is. You know, like, I, I, I can't remember it exactly, but, you know, so Tripp and Reed found themselves in front of two s stripper girls eating butterflies. A ridiculous concept, even on an alien world. That anybody, I mean, just like this is in the novel. This is in the novelization, and and just like commenting on how stupid characters were. And no, no good Starfleet captain would would have done this, but of course, Captain Archer was no ordinary Star Trek captain. But it was filled, and and I don't know if it was you or me called just to say, hey, we think this is funny, but you should know that this author has put that you've their, licensed the, the book. You obviously an editor missed. The fact that she hates the show, and it's reeking with hatred from beginning to end, and I don't know, remember exactly what happened. I think maybe she was reprimanded. That was that's absolutely true. I remember, and I don't remember at what stage we talked about a, a movie idea about some terrible threat to the galaxy that was going to require the greatest minds that Starfleet had to offer, and we were going to get Picard, Data. Like Odo, we're gonna get all the, the, the holographic doctor. We're gonna get all the Star Trek, all the the Star Trek characters on one ship, at like a think tank. Do you remember this? You don't remember this, do you? Mm -hmm. It was a cool idea. It was a cool idea. It was kind of like what the Avengers. It was like Star Trek: The Avengers, which, by the way, is still a good idea. It's still a good idea. Yeah. Um, no, well, you could also you might as well throw uh, Kirk in there as well. Star Trek's bigger than, I mean. Rick was involved longer than any one single individual that wasn't an, an actor, or uh, with anybody that was with the franchise. Eight, was it 18, 19 years? 18. 18 years. I was 15. But it's, it will go on, you know? It was in Nick Meyer's hands for a time. It was in, in Harv Bennett's hands. People were, 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 there were a lot of people squealing about Star Wars 
going on to Disney. But it's no different than Star Trek. It's Star Wars is bigger than George Lucas now, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it just? I mean, it, it, the the franchise will go into new hands, and maybe great things will be done with it. You know, for crying out loud. I don't know if you get this question. People are like, would you ever do Star Trek again? My answer is no, probably. Yeah, my, <laughs> you know, I mean, I can't, it's hard to imagine. You know? I, I don't get asked questions like that too often, but when I do, my answer is no. I, I did it for 18 years, and I and it was and, great. And and when when the day comes that somebody uh, creates a new Star Trek television series, they, I will not have a drop of animosity toward it. God bless them. Absolutely. I, 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 By the way, I love, I've, uh, st I've done Star Trek longer than any one thing in my life. It's occupied most of my adult life. I love Star Trek. I hope it's good. Yeah. Because I'm looking forward to seeing it. But I don't, but there's not a drop of bitterness. Oh, no. No, of course not. We had, we, we did it. But the, the, well, there is a drop. And that is, I think, it probably should have continued. That's my, that's my. But then again, it it, it, it had a good run. I have nothing but nostalgia about about the show. And um, at at one time it seems like yesterday, and another time it seems like a neon ago. How about you, Rick? You, you stole my line. There are times where I feel uh, I'll run into somebody like Connor Trenier, and uh, uh, I'll feel like I'll see it tomorrow on the set. And there are other times where it feels uh, like it was 30 years ago, like it was like some kind of strange dream. But it was, it was all fun. And to me, the most fun was the time we spent writing. Because I had never really done it to that degree, anywhere close to that degree before, and we had so much fun writing. Yeah, we did. We wrote, I don't know, know how many episodes we did, but you'd be surprised at how many there were. Over I think over 30. Um, it was, yeah, I agree. I, that was that was the most fun thing, and I miss those days. <laughs>